I've had the experience of introducing 9-11 to young people several times. I projected a page from Wikipedia on the 9-11 attacks. Whole page. And I highlighted one line. <laughs> I said I've highlighted a line that may be true. The rest of this is all false. And I'm going to try and explain why I say that. This is possibly the worst event since World War II. It has set nation against nation, religion against religion. And we now know that it's, it's a fraud. You can discover the fraud pretty quickly if you have the ability to read carefully and to look closely. It wasn't done by Arab extremists, and it doesn't justify bombing people in the Middle East and Central Asia. And so it raises the question in your mind, why? Why would the richest country in the world invade the poorest country in the world? My name is Graham McQueen, at least in this incarnation. I uh, have taken on many roles in my life. I'm an anti-war activist. I'm a researcher, at times a teacher, university professor, family man, a husband, a father, a brother. And I suppose, religiously speaking, you could call me a small b Buddhist. About three and a half years ago, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer, that is metastatic cancer. I was given a few years to live, and at this point, I'm given a few months. And although it may sound flaky or grandiose, I do have a sense of mission, and I have had for a very long time. And my mission is to oppose war on this earth. And so what I like about these last few months Excuse me if I tear up briefly. Is the ability to complete my mission. And I really don't think I have a very grandiose vision of what that's going to amount to. <laughs> Everyone in the world is going to rush out and say, oh my God, Graham McQueen has drawn together his articles. <laughs> no, no, that's not how it works. We make small steps when we are off the beaten track, when we've rejected mainstream politics, but they can be very fulfilling. And I like the idea of transmitting certain things to others, just as they were transmitted to me. What kind of a peace do I mean, and what kind of a peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana, enforced on the world by American weapons of war, I am talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time. I was born and raised in Nova Scotia, which is a province in the eastern part of Canada, still dear to my heart. My mother and father taught honesty, integrity, and compassion. And, and there are certain moments that I remember as of special importance. I'm, I'm eight or nine years old, standing in the living room, talking to my mother. And I don't know how we get onto it, but she says, you know, there's a man who, who has this idea of reverence for life, and he thinks that we should revere all living creatures, human and non-human. His name is Albert Schweitzer, she said. I'd never heard him before. And that was a transmission, because it felt right to me. And I thought, I've always felt this way. Now, finally, I can put some words on it. Reverence for life, later on, nonviolence. I can say, this is where I want to go with my life. So the late 50s and throughout the 60s were very important to me. War with North Vietnam 
You know, I couldn't believe the depths of evil. How on earth can anyone justify going to the other side of the world, to this obviously poor nation, and bombing the shit out of it? So there was that, and of course there were the assassinations, which even though, again, I was in Canada, believe me, they were traumatic for us too. I remember uh, in grade 11, the announcement coming over the PA that uh, President Kennedy had been shot. There was just such shock and sadness. And we feared that it might be, you know, someone sympathetic to the Soviet Union, and then God knows what would happen. I also remember when Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. He was a great hero of my father. Malcolm X, Bobby Kennedy, same thing. Years later, I realized that the course of American history had been changed through these false flag assassinations, where losers like Lee Harvey Oswald and the rest of them were set up. Whether we'll ever be able to undo that remains to be seen. The 80s were, were about peace for me. I would teach and then I would go off to a rally. You know, I was, I was away from home more than I should have been, but I was, I was in the fanatic phase. <laughs> and, um, and I gave all my time to that. And we were able to establish a thing called the Center for Peace Studies at my university. And I was named director. We had a lot going on, peace building work in Afghanistan and North India. We went to Central America where horrific things were happening at the time. In fact, it was a very important experience for me because of course you hear about the Cold War. Well, it may have been cold for people in Canada, but it was bloody hot if you're in El Salvador. If you're going to be a successful activist, you have to learn the details and the facts. I had never heard of peace studies or peace and conflict studies, as it's sometimes called. It was completely new to me. So back to the books, where I try and discover what this is and is this worth doing, and then I thought, this is hopeless. I either don't understand causes of war, or possibly I don't understand war at all. So I racked my brains and I thought, well, what has been the most insightful stuff I've heard about war recently? And I thought of a talk given by system theorist and game theorist Anatole Rapoport, who had been given a chair of peace studies at the University of Toronto. I think he accepted one dollar a year or something. And he said, don't think about war as an event or a series of events. Think about it as a system. It is a system that is hosted by particular societies and it draws its energy and its lifeblood from them and often to their disadvantage. Like a parasite, tumor on human society, which is the kind of image he used and is something that people die for and kill for and create all kinds of havoc for. Adapting. Now it's a feudal system, now it's a republican system, now it's a socialist system. War marches on, it finds ways to adjust. It's a thing, it's an entity. It profits people, it profits companies, it profits elites. You have to understand the system, and you have to understand what it's doing. You have to understand its phases, and if anything could be done to lessen its power over us, because Rappaport felt that whatever functions it may have played in the past, it had now morphed into this parasitic or cancerous growth, which now threatened to wipe us out.
And I thought, well, there could be all kinds of different phases and states in this complex system, but let's take the two most obvious, the cold phase, when you are not having active lethal activity, but the system's still there. You're still piling up weapons if you're human beings, for example. You're still showing movies that talk about the Russians as evil. You're still doing all the things needed to support the system, to keep it alive, to keep it healthy, to keep it flowing with blood. But then there's the hot system, where something triggers this state change, and suddenly there is now mass mutual lethal activity, in other words, killing the hot phase of the war system. And when you begin to think about that, you think about, well, what is it that triggers that phase change? And I became more and more interested in war triggers. These events, usually events, which can trigger the war system from a cold to a hot state, I began to see that there were at least three main types. I call them natural war triggers, managed war triggers, and manufactured war triggers. A natural war trigger is when, let's say, two armies smash into each other in the night. I'm speaking metaphorically but it's, it's nobody's fault. Something happens. They both want the same piece of territory. They're armed to the teeth. They're poor, they're hungry. A war breaks out. A managed war trigger is different. That's where, okay, you may have an accidental thing that happens, but you use it. You make a mountain out of a molehill very carefully because you want that major lethal conflict. You want hot war. So you're gonna manage this war trigger. The American people are willing to fight wars if their blood is up, if their blood is boiling hot. Well, what is it that triggers that phase change? Here are many miles from far Nippon on the Pacific. Our carriers creep toward Hawaii, and all preparations on board are completed. Strong wind blows, the sea is rough, and the waves are high. We can see Pearl Harbor as an example. Did the Japanese attack? Yes. Was it an act of aggression? Yes. Can I approve of it? Certainly not. Was it out of the blue? No way. All men are on deck, and the commander of the Imperial Air Squadron delivers an address. Now the greatest air attack in the annals of war will be carried out in a few moments. War heroes determined to respond to their country's call. They were thinking, how can we bring the United States in? The population doesn't want a war. They don't want to go to war. So they began to think about it, and they, they had a list of things we can do to provoke the Japanese. And, uh, and they left the sitting ducks in Pearl Harbor, and they had broken the Japanese codes. They could see when the Japanese Navy was moving toward Pearl Harbor. They let them come. And then, of course, it was all talked about as a day of infamy and an unprovoked attack. Well, it may have been a day of infamy, but it wasn't unprovoked. It was deliberately provoked. So I call that a managed war trigger. Yes, the Japanese did attack, but the whole thing was managed. And it was managed to bring the United States into the war and to get American citizens enthusiastic about war, which they had not been, and it was successful. You have to study it, you have to look at it. You might say, oh, I agree with Roosevelt. You might say, oh, that was a good war trigger, that's up to you but you gotta see it for what it is. And if you don't, you won't understand how populations are manipulated. And the third type of war trigger is the manufactured war trigger. And that's where the whole thing is basically made up. It's not just, you know, the Japanese attack and you make the most out of it. It's where you attack yourself, for example. Uh, false flag um, of one kind or another. And 9-11 is the perfect example of that. The Gulf of Tonkin event, which uh, brought the U.S. fully, they were already in there, but fully at war with the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the DRV, 
was, in my view, manufactured. By that I mean, uh, I originally thought it was managed. That, you know, okay, they had a couple of warships floating around and the Vietnamese sent some PT boats that fired a few shots at them and then there was major retaliation and this Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which essentially was a, a resolution of war. It looked to me like it was managed, but I think now it was manufactured. An example of the heat of the Cold War. The Democratic presidents felt need not to lose one square foot of territory to communism, particularly in Asia. To draw the line, to hold the line, because if you lose, the final domino in the domino sequence is not some Asian country, it's the presidency itself. In a military situation, quite often, the commanding officers, in this case the President of the United States, don't wait for the details to be settled. If they feel they're in a critical situation with a danger of military conflict, they make decisions without waiting for the intelligence detail. The DeSoto raids, so-called, which were being done by the U.S. on Vietnam, systematically, were intended to provoke Vietnam. And they were finally successful, and they provoked Vietnam. They actually provoked a very minor response, but it was immediately portrayed as communist aggression. Almost everyone bought it, not everyone, but almost everyone, and Congress voted almost unanimously for that resolution, which shows, by the way, that these events, whether managed or manufactured, can be used not only to rouse the population's fervor, but to manipulate their elected representatives. Legislatures have proven to be very weak reeds, very easy to manipulate by war triggers. Being in the minority never proves that you're wrong. In fact, history is going to record that Senator Greening and I voted in the interest of the American people this morning when we voted against this resolution. And I'd have the American people remember what this resolution really is. It's a resolution which seeks to give the President of the United States the power to make war without a declaration of war. Peace is a time when sons bury fathers. War is a time when fathers bury sons. If you are an uncritical flag waver, then you can be manipulated into doing anything. And of course, we saw that with 9-11. You know, this wasn't Al-Qaeda, this wasn't bin Laden, this wasn't Iraq. This was done by the planners in the US and possibly one or two other nations who wanted that event they wanted particular wars in particular regions of the world. They knew the American people would not support them unless something really bad happened. Take a look at them. They've been there since last night. They are here in the thousands. They are here in the tens of thousands. Occasionally they shout, Die Mauer muss weg, the wall must go. Thousands and thousands of West Germans come to make the point that the wall has suddenly become irrelevant something, as you can see, almost a party on. How do you measure such an astonishing moment in history? When the Cold War fell apart, there were mixed feelings amongst many of us, actually. On the one hand, what a wonderful thing that, for a little while at least, the idea of a nuclear war was much less likely. And we've been carrying that on our shoulders ever since we were children. But I knew those guys weren't going to just let that happen. I mean, there's huge interests there. These expenditures total approximately $47.5 billion, provide the forces which this nation needs for its foreign policy. In uh, Rebuilding America's Defenses, the document produced in the year 2000 by the Project for a New American Century, these guys are ecstatic about war. They think, you know, the United States should be the leader of the world, and this is how we do it. You have to have a strong military. That's the leading sector. You need to use it. You need to be willing to go in and beat people up. You need to be able to go and overthrow governments. They say all that. Now, as long as you have people like that in positions of great power, you've got your work cut out. 
They were mainly a group of neocons, like Paul Wolfowitz, Dick Cheney, and the familiar crew, militarists. Many people had called the 20th century the American century. This is where the United States really emerged as the world's biggest power. World War I, World War II, massive economic force, massive cultural force, the American century. Well, these guys said, okay, well, what does that mean? How about the 21st century? We want another American century. They said, look, our adversaries are either confused and fairly weak still like China, or completely broken like the former Soviet Union. This is our moment. This is how we make it an American century, not through just, you know, economic power or cultural power. The military should be the leading edge. This is how you'd have to do it. This is what we're good at. They say, that's good, it's good. It's good that we have all these hundreds of military bases. We can make people do whatever we want, and that's our aim. Our aim is to be dominant on land, sea, air, space, and cyberspace. Those are the five realms. The current U.S. military budget is $778 billion. The United States, in many cases, has spent as much on its military as the rest of the world combined at various times in the past. So this is a country that's become highly militarized. And this is a group of people that are not embarrassed. These people actually want the United States to dominate the whole world, and they're stupid enough to think it's possible. Through much of the last century, America's faith in freedom and democracy was a rock in a raging sea. Now it is a seed upon the wind, taking root in many nations. Our democratic faith is more than the creed of our country. It is the inborn hope of our humanity, an ideal we carry but do not own, a trust we bear and pass along. And this group of hawks, I think, was very influential whether directly or indirectly, in the 9-11 events and what came after that. They talk about how um, reforming the U.S. military will be a long and difficult task unless there is a catalytic event like a new Pearl Harbor. Well, that's what they wanted, and that's what they got, and that's what they did. Oh, my God. Oh my God. This created mass murder. In public, 3,000 people were killed. My wife, who had been at work and come home, was sitting there watching television. It was horrific. The scene here is just one right out of one of those movies you would see in Hollywood. People walking around in tears, uh, holding their heads, looking up at what's left of the World Trade Center, just shaking their heads in disbelief. What the hell is I have the strangest memories <clears throat> because on the one hand, I uh, couldn't really see any option but the mainstream one we were being given, so I sort of accepted it. 
And I think what was going on there is that my intuition at one level knew there was something wrong about this, but I hadn't been able to figure it out with my rational mind. And so I went into a kind of dogmatic slumber for several years, just kind of rousing myself occasionally to think that maybe the official story wasn't right. Curiously enough, one such incident was when I went to a meeting in the World Health Organization in Geneva. I think it was 2003, if I remember correctly. And I gave a paper and people gave papers. And, and you know, uh, publicly, the WHO officials were all, oh, you know, everything's good, you know, everything's fine. If you got them outside, which I did, under a tree, not just one or two, but several, this person's from India, this person's from Thailand, this person, because the UN personnel come from all over. We, we got onto the topic of 9-11, and I discovered that suspicion of that event was very strong. Yeah, but they wouldn't dissent from it publicly because they valued their jobs. And I thought, well, there's some pretty smart people here, and they know a lot, and they're suspicious of this, so it it encouraged me to look more deeply into the event. The scene here is reminiscent of a, a nuclear winter. That right now everyone is walking around with masks, covering their faces. There's people just wandering the streets, covered in blood, covered in plaster. They were near the site when the buildings collapsed. And then, in 2005, I had a conversation with a man named Ralph Schoenman. He used to be Bertrand Russell's personal assistant. He's a good old lefty. And Schoenman got on to 9-11, and uh, he said to me, surely you don't think that was done by Al-Qaeda? And I said, well, you know, I've been having my doubts, but I haven't really read anything really good yet on, on the dissident side. He said, well, you're not doing your homework then. And I said, well, Ralph, if you'll give me a couple of references, I promise to read them because I'm very interested in this. So he did. And uh, I looked and read them all very closely and I thought, wow, this really does look like a fraud. And then, this was now late 2005, I read an article by David Ray Griffin, who has since become a friend. And I believe it was called Explosive Testimony. It had to do with the firefighters of New York and what they witnessed on 9-11. Because I had wondered if this was a fraud and the buildings were blown up, surely a lot of people would have seen that. A lot of people would have heard that. A lot of people might have felt that explosion. Where are the witnesses? But there was nothing as systematic as this article. This article showed quite a few really clear cases where firefighters had heard and seen things in the towers that suggested explosions. And I thought, well, what am I going to do about this? It seems, that although this is a very good article, it leaves me with many questions. So it was clear to me that what needed to be done was that somebody needed to sit down and read all 12,000 pages of the World Trade Center Task Force report, which, as far as I knew, nobody else in the world was going through these page by page, even though they're extremely important. And I had some clear questions to address to them. And I said to myself, okay, I may not be a firefighter, I may not be an engineer, I may not be an architect, but I do know how to do textual analysis. That's what I was trained to do. Read huge amounts of text, ask the right questions, and if possible, create some kind of a numerical comparison. So that's what I did. I think a bomb went off in the lobby. First, then a plane hit the building. But then another plane hit the other building. I just feel a little shook up because I got blasted. As we were coming out, we passed the lobby. There was no lobby. So I believe the, the bomb hit the lobby first. And a couple of seconds in the first plane hit. Explosion on the South World Trades <laughs> happened. And I said, this is something we have to do. We have to back out. That's what I was caught again in the second explosion. We were just dragging people along with us. And then when we came outside, it just blew. The tower blew. Boom. Boom, 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 boom. And as the bombs were gone, people just started running. I just turned around and I just started running for my life. I looked at which people in the fire department of New York had been in a position to directly witness the destruction 
of the Twin Towers, and I wanted to know how many described what they saw without mentioning explosions, and how many used explosions and similar terms, which I list, like blast, to describe what they witnessed. And I found 118 talked about explosions, and 10 didn't. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. 118 is a lot of eyewitnesses, actually. Uh, and people will come along and say, eyewitness evidence is notoriously unreliable. But actually, that's ridiculous. I mean, the police uh, and other investigators use eyewitness evidence all the time. How do I know? Because I read the manuals. I read police journals. I read manuals on criminal investigation, fire investigation, explosion investigation. None of them dismiss eyewitness evidence. Of course they don't. They use all the evidence they have. Sometimes this is the most important. I'm making our way to the stairway. Give me your phone number. There was a uh, heavy duty explosion. The whole building just collapsed on us inside the lobby. Is that a secondary explosion? Yes, it was. The World Trade Center, we took uh, a hit on that last explosion. The man post is being evacuated this time. I don't know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse. To me, it sounded like it. it to me, it sounded like. An explosion, then, then the building, the rolling sound sounded like the building collapsed. With, with, as time went on, I found there were other objections people made. Some said, oh, it could have been anything. That was another good, vague one. It could have been, you know, beams breaking, or it could have been bodies hitting the ground, which of course happened. Of course I was annoyed because I felt these people clearly hadn't read the accounts carefully, but nonetheless, I decided I had to take it seriously. So I finally came out and decided that the 118, which in the meantime had grown to 156 because I kept looking, they weren't all firefighters now. Some of them were police officers, some of them were people in the building, but I had 156 eyewitnesses to explosions. And I came up with three categories that seemed to me to make it clear that these were not innocent events. And I call them power, pattern, and identification. Power means None of the regular explosions you expect in a high-rise fire. Smoke explosions, boiling liquid, expanding vapor, like a boiler, right? Or, and certainly not the jet fuel. None of these could have destroyed these enormous, very strong buildings. So that's power. The second is pattern. We had several people who very clearly saw strings of explosions in succession. Boom, 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 around the building or up and down the building. And they described it carefully, people like Karen DeShore. Yes, they were orange and red flickering on and off. And some people were very clear about the fact that this looked like a controlled demolition to them. They would say, have you ever seen on, on TV when they blow up these buildings? Well, that's what it sounded like. Others said it sounded like a series of gunshots, like the building is being deliberately destroyed. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if, if they had detonated. Yeah, you know, as detonated. As if they were planned to yeah. take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. Explosions were coming down the building. It looked as if charges had been set on each floor and they were in succession going off. I looked and I could see the corner and it just started going pop. It just started going boom, 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 boom. And he goes, how fast? I go like firecrackers. Identification has to do with, we had a lot of experienced firefighters. Over 300 of them died in the towers, but others survived and they, they were used to high rise fires in New York City and we would expect them to tell us if they thought these were innocent explosions. But they don't, with very few exceptions. And in fact, uh, one of the terms I counted was bomb. 31 people used the term bomb to describe what they experienced. So there's nothing innocent about that. A big explosion has just occurred. Everyone is running from the entire financial district now. The smoke is filling the entire area. Let's go. Come on, go, Brad, go. Stop shooting, Brad, go. And all of a sudden, it was this big explosion. I don't know if it's just like what you just seen. That's what we went through before we came out of the building. Then when we get out the building, then another smoke cloud came. We had to go through that smoke cloud again. Mom, I just want you to know I'm all right. <laughs> and this becomes not 
the final proof of anything, but it becomes one form of very important evidence, eyewitness evidence, because the official story has no room for explosions, especially not the kind that would pulverize these enormous steel frame buildings. Oh my God! That was a bomb that did that. Oh God, look at that! That was a fucking bomb that did that. There's no goddamn oh way that could have happened. God. Explosion! Marine 6th of Manhattan, urgent. Tower 2 has had a major explosion and what appears to be a complete collapse surrounding the entire area. Major explosion. Unknown determined number of injuries at this time. This is the second explosion. Uh, the second tower appears to be down. I wish I could give you an exact location. I can't read anything from now. It's still exploding over here. Stretch Broadway. Everything's exploding around us. I'm down the block by the explosion. I was there when it went off. I just dug myself out. We studied TV footage. We managed to collect about 70 hours of it from various different sources, mainly continuous footage, so that we could put things in context. We wanted to know what the TV networks um, were actually showing on the day itself, 9-11. Now, the first question was reporters on the scene, TV reporters on the scene. How many of them, of those who directly witnessed the towers coming down, how many of them talked about explosions and how many didn't? And I believe it was something like 21 out of 24 of those eyewitnesses talked about explosions, something like 84%. And some Jamie, people were... Jamie, I need you to stop for a second. There has just been a huge explosion. We can see uh, a billowing smoke rising. And I can't, I'll, I'll tell you that I can't see that second tower. Watch the right it's side. exploding. Oh, man, ripping apart. It is billowing. The debris is flying. I'm gonna run. There was another major explosion. The, build, the building itself, literally the top of it, came down, sending smoke and debris everywhere. John, just seconds ago, there was a huge explosion, and it appears right now the second World Trade Tower has just collapsed. I looked up, and that's when I heard the... <coughs> pardon me. That's when I heard the explosion. That's when the second tower came down. I spoke with some police officials moments ago, Chris, and they told me that they have reason to believe that one of the explosions at the World Trade Center may have been caused by a van that was parked in the building that may have had some type of explosive device in it. The chief safety of the uh, fire department of New York City told me that there was another explosion that took place uh, in one of the towers here. Uh, so obviously, he, according to his theory, he thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. I think every cable station, local affiliate and network, except Fox News, at some point during the day entertained the possibility that these buildings had been blown up. So it wasn't way out there. It was very sober anchors saying, you know, what happened here? Do you suppose they were taken down? in a controlled demolition fashion. So that was an important finding, because sometimes people will say only the occasional flake or conspiracy theorist talks about explosions in the towers. Nope, people on the ground, and people in the newsroom, they were all talking about it. I recognize we're dealing with so few facts. Is it possible that just a plane crash could have collapsed these buildings, or would it have required the sort of prior positioning of other explosives in the building. What do you think? Anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the, at the under infrastructure of a building and bring it down. Generally speaking, for a building to collapse in on itself like that, it would seem to indicate, obviously this is just early speculation, but it would seem to indicate that there could have been an explosion, a bomb planted on the ground that would make the building collapse within itself. You have to wonder if there was something else there, it, but you know, we just don't know. Yeah, we point. don't know, but and it looks like, I, I think we're safe, here I think I'm on safe ground, Bill. I don't think this um, was clearly, the, the, the way the structure is collapsing, this was the result of something that was planned. This is not, it's not accidental 
that the first tower just happened to collapse and then the second tower just happened to collapse in exactly the same way. How they accomplished this, we don't know. We've heard reports of secondary explosions after the aircraft impacted, whether in fact there wasn't something else at the base of the towers that in fact were the coup de grace to bring them to the ground. When you're looking at evidence of any kind, you look for corroboration. And there's two kinds, corroboration of the same kind and corroboration of a different kind. Corroboration of the same kind is if there's an eyewitness, is there more than one? Well, yeah, there were 156, which is enough to hang a man in most courts. Secondly, there's corroboration of different kinds. What did they find in the dust? We know what they found. They found evidence of extreme high temperatures. They found nanothermite. What else happened? Well, we watched the rate of the building fall, and so on and so forth. For anyone who looks into it, they'll find that there's massive corroboration of the same and of different kinds. And, and we're being very cautious, really, when we say it's clear these buildings were intentionally demolished. The evidence is overwhelming. Whoa! Oh my God! That was another bomb, guys. That was definitely another bomb. Yeah. Oh my God. That was definitely another bomb. Oh my God, it's gone. It's gone. They took it down, man. The second thing we discovered was is more complex. We thought. Given the number of their own people on the scene who were talking about the, the, this, these things being blown up, how on earth did it happen that by the end of the day on 9-11, an entirely different story was being told? At the end of the day, everyone was singing from the same hymn book, and they were saying that a Saudi dissident by the name of Osama bin Laden and his group of merry men had somehow piloted planes into the buildings and the planes brought them down. You know, there was no explosions or anything involved apart from the initial jet fuel. And it turned out we found there were two main mechanisms that were used to brush aside the possibility that these buildings had been demolished. The first was, if you've got a news anchor that's seriously exploring this possibility, like CNN's Aaron Brown, then you send him an engineer and you make this engineer say to him, no, 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 it was the planes that brought them down, nothing else necessary. This happened at least in three cases. And the second is more subtle, but much more widespread. The second technique used to establish the main narrative. And that is that you tell a good story. And there were actually two interrelated stories. One was the story called The War on Terror, and the second is Osama bin Laden. You're saying evil people from across the seas came to our country and set their foot on our soil, and they smashed their planes into these buildings because they hate us and they hate our freedoms. And we found that they told this War on Terror story very carefully, starting in the morning, late morning, of 9-11 and then getting stronger and stronger all day long. Um, Fox News is probably the most suspect in the sense that John Scott mentions Osama bin Laden. I think it's less than 60 seconds after the second tower is struck. We just saw on live television as a second plane flew into the second tower of the World Trade Center. Now, given what has been going on around the world, um, some, of the, some of the key suspects come to mind, Osama bin Laden, who knows, who knows what. You know, excuse me? We didn't even know this was a crime until this building was struck. We thought it could have been an accident, could have been anything. And suddenly he's coming out with Osama bin Laden. Many of his viewers wouldn't even know who that was. The other stations are slower, but they all get there.
Uh, my favorite suspect here, and I have no uh, inside information uh, with respect to this, is, uh, is Osama bin Laden. He seems to be the favorite suspect of a lot of people. There are, quote, good indications that people with links to the Osama bin Laden organization are responsible for today's attacks. Uh, we can't do much better right now at identifying these sources. And others have mentioned that they believe Osama bin Laden is perhaps the only terrorist with the kind of organization who could plan something this massive and this deadly. There's only one group that has ever indicated that it has this kind, kind of ability, and that's Osama bin Laden. Editor of a London-based Arabic newspaper saying he received a warning from associates of Osama bin Laden, but did not take them seriously. Osama bin Laden's name again and again and again, and they used authorities, especially state authorities, like former Secretary of Defense, former Secretary of State, uh, former Prime Minister of Israel, he was very helpful. Ehud Barak, he was in a BBC news station. All these people say, in effect, look, what has just happened to us is an act of war, and America must respond with war, and we must go full out on this. We're going to go places, we're going to bomb people. And, um, you know, as at least one of the speakers said, I'm sorry to say, you know, we're going to have to spill some blood here. The former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, is uh, joining us now uh, from our Washington Bureau. Uh, Newt, what's your reaction and what should be America's reaction to the, these developments? This is a 21st century Pearl Harbor. This is a 21st century kind of war. Uh, I think we need to refer to it as an act of war. This was, a, this was not a random event by a random terrorist. This was a systematic, complex operation of military proportions undertaken cleverly by people who have state support and who only survive because they have the support of some states that protect them. And I hope that the American government, the president, and the American people will react to this as an act of war uh, this will be more casualties, I believe, than Pearl Harbor. It is at least as horrifying as Pearl Harbor, and it deserves a complete and total American response to ensure that it never happens again. So this was a pretty uh, powerful story that was being told, the story of the evil invaders, and the righteous now get angry and strike back, and we are the righteous. And uh, we got to take it, take this war to them, and they even name the states, especially Ehud Barak. He says, well, it's no mystery who these people are. Iran, Iraq, he names all the regional adversaries of Israel and wants them taken out. It was in its own way brilliantly done. The timing was perfect. They did everything very, very professionally. It took money, it took training, it took time, and you have to ask yourself, who is capable of that, and you start out with Osama bin Laden. But it wasn't based on evidence, that's the point. The eyewitness evidence of explosions actually would have belonged in a courtroom. Whereas all the stuff these guys were telling us, oh, Osama bin Laden said at one point a few months ago he's going to do something bad since it must be him. You know, I'm sorry, that doesn't make it to a courtroom. It was gossip, there was rumor, there were lies. There was no good evidence. A terrorist attack is an attack that is meant to cause terror, especially politically useful terror. The question is, who were the terrorists? Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbored them. The 19 hijackers 
The evidence supporting their activities on 9-11, the alleged activities, is extremely weak. This has been pointed out by numerous researchers. Elias Davidson, the late Elias Davidson, did a good job on this. He said, if we were going to believe these guys were on the planes and were doing all that, we would want to see verified, certified boarding passes and tickets and, and videos in the airport. We would want to have courtroom-worthy testimony from people that checked them in. We would want to have some of their DNA. But what we need to do, you see, again and again, is say it's not up to me to prove they weren't on the plane. It's up to the official story people to prove that they were on the plane. And they did all that stuff. The burden of proof is on them. And they haven't done it. Part of the reason they haven't been forced to do it is because there hasn't been a proper trial. And that's what a trial is for. You bring forward evidence. This never happened with 9-11. It's all about war, and war has no interest as a system in evidence or reason. It's not about evidence and reason. It's about dominance through force. The images, the pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, these were intended to frighten citizens of the United States and other nations, to terrorize them. It was basically what's called shock and awe. And people, when they move into that frame of mind of extreme fear, tend to depend on their leaders. They tend to unite, but in a hierarchical way not a cooperative union, but a, an obedient union. I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people, and the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. The U.S. Constitution actually gives to Congress the power to declare war, not to the president. Once war is declared, the president may be commander in chief, but it's not his job to bring a nation into war. The White House knew they needed a resolution by Congress, and they needed it very quickly, while people's blood was still boiling hot. Many people, seeing that Senate Majority Leader, Democrat Tom Daschle, put forward the authorization on the use of military force on September 14th, probably thought he drafted it, but no. He received a copy, a draft, of this resolution from the White House, which had very quickly drafted it after the 9-11 attacks. It basically gave the president the power to go after anybody he wanted, anytime he wanted, which gave a kind of cover for the succeeding invasions and wars. As a member of the clergy so eloquently said, as we act, let us not become the evil that we deplore. The mailman has a long day. He gets to the post office before seven o'clock. Letters are most important. He puts the letters for each family in their own place. He straps the letters up in bundles so they won't get out of order. Now they're ready for him to hand out. Starting about a week after the 9-11 attacks, letters began to be put in the mail, which contained the spores of deadly anthrax. Altogether, at least 22 people became infected with anthrax. Some people think the true figure is twice that. And five died. Now, when you see that five died, you might say, well, it's pretty minor compared to 9-11. And it is in terms of casualties. But in another sense, it's not minor at all. You could have massive casualties if you really planned it that way spreading anthrax spores. Furthermore, two of those letters were sent to senators so that this was technically an attack on Congress with a weapon of mass destruction, which is what a biological weapon is. 
and these were clearly weaponized. So I thought to myself, how come I haven't looked into these anthrax attacks? Because people are telling me that the anthrax in the envelopes was traced to U.S. military labs. I mean, come on, guys. If that's true, what do we got here? We've got on September 11th, a bunch of real Islamic terrorists create a terrorist attack. A week later, fake Islamic terrorists create uh, an attack on the U.S., especially New York and Washington. Isn't there something odd there? I mean, it's theoretically possible the first was genuine and the second was fake, but isn't it possible they were both fake? Anthrax. 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 Federal sources said privately today that they believe the anthrax bacteria that killed one Florida man and was found in another was man-made, not a freakish event of nature. It is just one more concern over homeland security, an area my Nightline colleague John Donvan has been following. Confirmed. One man is dead, Bob Stevens, a photo editor at The Sun, the cause was anthrax. Confirmed. A second man, Ernesto Blanco, who worked in the same building, was also exposed to the same strain of the bacteria and is now receiving antibiotics. One of the first things I discovered when I was doing research on the anthrax attacks was an overlap in personnel that I had not been aware of that the, some of the so-called 19 hijackers who'd carried out the 9-11 attacks had also been implicated in the anthrax attacks. A little less directly, but still, they were there. You couldn't deny they were there. So we find that a lot of the so-called 9-11 hijackers identified with locations along the coast of Florida, in the midst of which the first anthrax victim died. Now, this obviously could be a coincidence, but well, let's look at this more closely and see, see what happens when we do. They have been relentlessly digging dirt on the Taliban and Osama bin Laden. So is it a coincidence that this office building, headquarters to most American tabloids, has been hit by the deadly anthrax virus? Bob Stevens' neighbor, Louis Saletti, is nervous. He lives just one mile from the airstrip where suspected hijacker Mohammed Atta took flying lessons. So when we look more closely, we find that a woman named Gloria Irish who was a real estate agent for the first person to die of anthrax. And who else was she a real estate person for? Well, several of the 9-11 hijackers. And I thought, why is it we don't know that? And I thought, I, know, I think I know why we don't know that. Originally, we were supposed to follow the breadcrumbs, and we were supposed to see that these 19 hijackers were indeed involved in both attacks and that the attacks were a one-two punch delivered to the United States. First 9-11, then biological weapons attack. But the anthrax attacks failed so completely, that is to say, it was discovered quite quickly that the anthrax came from U.S. highly secure military labs, that suddenly the anthrax attacks became unusable, and you had to push all kinds of stuff down the memory hole. And at this point, you definitely didn't want people to know the hijackers were involved in both attacks, because if they were involved in the false anthrax attacks, it followed that the 9-11 attacks were false too. And so all those little connections were erased. Attorney General Ashcroft introduced a thing called the Patriot Act, and uh, it did, among other things, it gave more power to U.S. intelligence and less freedom to American citizens. It was therefore bound to be a controversial bill, and it was huge. He introduced it and said, I'd like this passed this week. Well, which was ridiculous. You know, nobody could read it in a week. But he kept going after Democrats for delaying the passage of this bill. And two of the Democrats that were somewhat delaying it were Tom Daschle, Senate Majority Leader, and Patrick Leahy, who was the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, which had the job of scrutinizing all this kind of legislation and making sure that it was, it was right. And so they dug in their heels at one point and said, you know what, this can't go through as it is. We, can, we need a little more time to make some compromises and think about it. So what happens next? Anthrax letters are sent to Senator Leahy and Senator Daschle. And they're sent off within about three days 
after the missed deadline. And they put themselves at risk of death by slowing down the passage of the Patriot Act. Vice President Cheney had said, I want this passed by October 5th, 2001. And we're all supposed to believe this was Al-Qaeda who sent these. Al-Qaeda has somehow taken a, a great dislike to senators in the Democratic Party who are trying to hold up the Patriot Act. It's ridiculous, okay? These were very sophisticated anthrax letters, highly weaponized stuff. When an aide opened the letter for Daschle in, in the office, it floated out like cigarette smoke and quickly contaminated the entire Hart Senate building, which then had to be closed for several months for cleaning. It's not easy to get anthrax to behave that way. And we've had several studies of it which show that it's the most sophisticated anthrax spores ever seen and the only people that we know for sure that can make it are in the United States. Dugway Proving Ground or Battelle Memorial Institute, those are the two main suspects. And Iraq, which they tried to implicate, was nowhere near that in their sophistication. Even if they still had their anthrax program going, which they didn't, they had destroyed it. But even if they had, they couldn't make that stuff. And um, I don't know how, how it is that the planners failed and uh, some honest scientists jumped over the fence at some point here, um, but they did. And so then the whole thing started to collapse. There was no case against Iraq. So then they were forced into a desperate move, uh, what's called a limited hangout. We will admit some things are true in order to protect the big truths. We will admit now that this, and this is by December 2001, so this is happening quickly. We will admit that this didn't come from Iraq, even though we said it did, didn't come from Al-Qaeda, even though the letters looked like it did, came from somehow within our own military industrial complex. But it was a guy. It was one guy, a sick guy. It was the lone nut. And they charged, ultimately, Bruce Ivins. First it was Stephen Hatfield, then it was Bruce Ivins, who conveniently took his own life before he could go to trial. And so then they proclaimed the whole thing was over, the case had been solved, case dismissed, tried to put the anthrax attacks to bed. Today we take an essential step in defeating terrorism while protecting the constitutional rights of all Americans. With my signature, this law will give intelligence and law enforcement officials important new tools to fight a present danger. We've seen the enemy in the murder of thousands of innocent, unsuspecting people. They recognize no barrier of morality. They have no conscience. The terrorists cannot be reasoned with. Witness the recent anthrax attacks. These terrorists must be pursued. They must be defeated. And they must be brought to justice. So one lie after another, dutifully reported in all the major newspapers from the New York Times to The Guardian. And this is one of the things that was brought home to me when I wrote that book on the anthrax attacks, was just how deeply, deeply complicit the media were. There wouldn't have been any uh, operation at all without them. It would have been impossible. So just to finish off the Iraq story, in... Uh, 2003, just before the invasion of Iraq, Colin Powell went to the UN Security Council, lied his head off, and one of the things he did as part of his dramatic presentation was hold up a little vial of simulated anthrax and said, just this much anthrax, shut down the Senate building, you know, and made Congress flee town and all these horrible things. And then he showed a picture of Iraq's aerial dispersion techniques, you know, the wings of an airplane with little nozzles on them. Didn't bother to tell us that that had all been destroyed by Iraq. Um, 
didn't bother to tell us that the, the anthrax attacks had nothing to do with Iraq, in fact, had been, come from the U.S. itself. And this leads us to the study by the Center for Public Integrity, which did a really good kind of careful study of comments made by leading Bush administrators over a two-year period from September 11, 2001 to September 11, 2003, on two topics. The topic of did Saddam support terrorists such as Al-Qaeda, specifically, and number two, did Saddam have weapons of mass destruction at the time of 9-11? And of course, both were false, but both statements were made repeatedly. They found 935 false statements by those officials in a two-year period. I like to quote that because it shows the level of mendacity and deception that we're dealing with, and the fact that, you know, a research center could come out with this and the media would not be interested. It should have been headlines all over the world. Many people don't get the deep state, are not able to imagine a treachery and a betrayal of this kind and of this scope. Why have those who are usually careful critics of U.S. domestic and foreign policy, broadly speaking, the U.S. left and the left leadership especially, why have they been so bad on 9-11? I, I think the fear of looking ridiculous and of admitting you were wrong for years and years on a really important topic is at work here. Why did I have to discover 156 eyewitnesses to explosions in the towers? They had all the same documents I did. I didn't have any secret documents. So again, we don't have an innocent civilian controlled government. We have something else. Dark forces of certain kinds are implicated in these horrific events and are obviously covering it up. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the Joint Staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me and he said, sir, you got to come in. You got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> so I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're gonna take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. I said, is it classified? He said, yes, sir. The first strike against terrorism as a missile barrage lands on Afghanistan. The Taliban claims Osama bin Laden was unhurt in the raids, and the world waits for the next move. warships and planes launched the opening salvo of Operation Iraqi Freedom. The attack came in waves, cruise missiles, followed by the F-117 stealth bombers with so-called bunker-busting bombs. I find it very suspect that Congress would be called upon so quickly to give the president that kind of power and authority, given how little was really known about what had happened and who had done it. But you have to remember, by this time, the nation is in the grip of a myth, a story, the war and terror story, the evil Islamist story, the Osama bin Laden story. There will be no justice involved here, formally or informally. We've already decided he did it even though we haven't been able to give the world any decent evidence. 
So hand him over or we will commit war against you, which is what was done. The ship is already gearing up to launch more air attacks tonight. The war plan is still fluid. However, tonight's assault is not expected to be as intense as the one we saw last night. One pilot described it this way. Like a street fight, you punch hard, then you step back, see what the situation is before you decide to punch again. This has nothing to do with Iraq having weapons of mass destruction or being a support of terrorism or anything else. It's what they call here constabulary action. You know, we've got a recalcitrant guy, a leader that doesn't like us, a government that is willing to resist us and our Israeli companions. So we, we, we get rid of them. We overthrow somebody's government. On what legal basis? They don't care. Nine eleven was a terrible crime, but let's not start lashing out at other people. Most people there didn't even know where the World Trade Center was. But war, as a primitive system, is all about collective punishment. Clear fire. Clear fire. Fire. That's what it is. It's collective entities. Your nation, my nation, will battle it out. And of course we will kill you in large numbers. We don't give a damn if you yourself had anything to do with it. This is how war works. It's heartbreak. We can't leave the television. Every tank, every helicopter is that my son. There are moms, there are dads, there are wives out there that are suffering because of this. Suddenly, the U.S. annual military budget goes way up, which it did steadily for 10 years. And the Canadian military budget went up, and the world military budget went up. And that was part of the point of it, was to revitalize the system, to breathe new oxygen into its lungs. And suddenly, I find myself on the streets again, which rather rapidly turned into an anti-war activity focused on 9-11. We were charged with finding out the cause of the collapse, and we we uh, found uh, what happened. I think uh, we've scientifically demonstrated uh, what was required to initiate the collapse. Once the collapse initiated, the video evidence is rather clear. It, it was not stopped by the floors below, so there was no calculation that we did uh, to demonstrate that. Uh, what is clear from the videos. National Institute of Standards and Technology didn't really do its job in trying to explain the destruction of the Twin Towers. They say in a footnote, oh, by the way, we didn't bother trying to explain the entire collapse of the buildings. We just took it up to collapse initiation. And I began looking at some very good video records, because we had lots of video records of these buildings coming down. And I said, OK, what's their hypothesis? It's the hypothesis that some people caricature as the sledgehammer hypothesis or the pile driver hypothesis. They're saying, let's take the North Tower as our example. The North Tower had uh, about six floors damaged by the airplane and the ensuing fires. Above that was about 12 stories undamaged, which is the pile driver or the sledgehammer in this hypothesis. And then about 92 stories of cold, undamaged steel columns getting thicker and thicker and wider and wider toward the bottom. And somehow, this sledgehammer, according to them, the 12 stories of the building, falls through the six damaged floors, 
and deals such a blow to the remaining 92 that they give up the ghost in about, you know, 16 or 18 seconds. And they don't just come down. They are, to a large extent, the building is pulverized. And, and if this is right, then this sledgehammer, this top 12 stories, is going to have to go really bump when it hits the rest of the building. It would have required one powerful jolt. You can't talk about the weight bringing the tower down. The only thing that could bring the tower down is if there was a high degree of force. It would have to be perceptible to us as deceleration of the upper block and acceleration of the 92 stories below. If you were banging in nails with a hammer, let's say you had a little hammer and a big nail, which is what we've got in this case, and the hammer never slows down when you hit the nail, something's wrong, my friends. There's no jolt. It's a smooth curve as it comes down. And I met an engineer, a lovely man by the name of Tony Zambotti, who said, that's an interesting finding you've got there. And Tony shows with the mathematics and the graphs just how perceptible it would be. In retrospect, would it have been different had there been more supporting beams in a, you know, in a, in a greater area around this, around this building? Well, frankly, it's hard to imagine a, a building having more steel than this structure. About 75 flights up, below the fire, I saw from the corner, boom, 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 boom. Just like 20 straight hits just went down, and then I just saw the whole, the whole building just went. Explosions were coming down the building. It looked as if charges had been set on each floor, and they were in succession going off. Lieutenant, where are you right now? I'm at the corner of Northmore Street and Greenwich Street. Can you confirm it was number seven that just went in? Yes, sir. Uh, and you were, you guys knew this was coming all day? We had heard reports that the building was unstable and that it eventually would either come down on its own or it would be taken down. The collapse of World Trade 7 had become already controversial, and foreknowledge of its collapse was starting to become controversial as well. I just want to reiterate for you, if we can zoom in past me, that building right there, the brown building, the tall one, is number seven, World Trade Center. I've heard several reports from several different officers now that that is the building that is going to go down next. In fact, one officer told me they're just waiting for that to come down. The four block radius has been cordoned off because fire officials expect that building to collapse. We are getting information now that one of the other buildings, Building 7 in the World Trade Center complex, is on fire and has either collapsed or is collapsing. We've got some news just coming in, actually, that the Salomon Brothers building in New York, right in the, uh, the heart of Manhattan, has also collapsed. Building 7 was a skyscraper that was part of the World Trade Center complex. There were seven buildings in the complex. It was north of the Twin Towers, across Vesey Street from the North Tower. It, it, it uh, evidently underwent some damage when the North Tower went down, and it was on parts of it, certain floors of it were on fire for part of the day. But it was never hit by a plane, and yet it went into complete freefall collapse suddenly at about 5.20 in the afternoon, one of the most astonishing sites connected to 9-11, which is why if you study this, you'll find a lot of people talking about Building 7. 
Now, one of the odd things was that uh, I think by that time it had become clear to us that the BBC reported the collapse of World Trade 7 uh, over 20 minutes before it actually came down. More now about that from our correspondent Jane Stanley. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse? And the, their reporter was standing right in front of it saying, yeah, it's too bad it went down. <laughs> of course, it's standing there looking just fine. So this led to a lot of controversy, and uh, I decided to write another article, which was again based on the eyewitness testimony, which by this point I was getting pretty familiar with. Although, of course, this required my going through the 12, 12,000 pages yet again and drawing up charts. And um, I found that there were about 60 people in the fire department of New York who talked about the fact that this building was going to come down or likely to come down. And I was interested in knowing a couple of things. First of all, when did they make this prediction? And secondly, how confident were they in this prediction? And finally, I guess the third one is quite important, did they make this prediction on the basis of having seen damage to the building or for some other reason? And I found that about half of them had made the prediction two hours or more in advance, which is a heck of a prediction, really since the building didn't appear to most observers to be that badly damaged, and since no steel frame skyscraper of that sort had ever come down from fire before, the only damage of any significance you could see was the fire. Structural damage was determined by NIST to be minor. The collapse of WTC-7 has been a source of extensive speculation. It did not fit any textbook example of that you could readily point to and say yes, that's why the buildings fell. No planes hit the building. There was damage to the building from the collapse of World Trade Center 1. But despite damage that severed seven exterior columns, Building 7 remained standing. By this time, NIST had come out with its report on the collapse of Building 7, so we didn't have to guess about raging infernos and, and fuel oil in the building. NIST had ruled all that out. They'd also said the structural damage was minor and couldn't have caused the building to collapse. So they came up with a rather exotic interpretation based on the expansion of metal due to fire. And one thing led to another, and suddenly the whole thing came, <laughs> came down. Um, it's a pretty silly hypothesis, but let's not get into that now. Let's just look at the, how it affects foreknowledge. First of all, according to NIST, you couldn't see from the outside what was going on in the building. You couldn't see that there was an expanding member which led to an unseated column or any of that stuff. That stuff was invisible to the eye. Furthermore, these events which led to the demise of the building, according to NIST, happened very soon before it came down, possibly seconds, at most minutes. So what were people doing predicting two hours and four hours in advance? Didn't fit. Did they make this judgment on the basis of seeing the towering inferno? Did they make it on the basis of seeing some cut columns? No, the great, great majority of them said it's coming down because we've been told it's coming down. And they were typically told by superior officers who later claimed in many cases to have been told by an engineer on the site. Uh, our special operations people set up surveying instruments to monitor and see if there was any movement of the building. Uh, we were concerned of the possibility of collapse of the building. And we had a discussion with one particular engineer there, and we asked him if we uh, allowed it to burn, uh, could we anticipate a collapse, and if so, how soon? And it turned out that he was pretty much right on the money, that he said uh, in his current state, about you have about five hours. Keep your eye on that building. It'll be coming down soon. Yeah. I don't want to hear what it does. The building is about to blow up. Moving back. Ja, je ziet dit. De onderste verdiepingen gaan eerst. Ja, en de rest zakt er gewoon in. Dus dit is controlled demolition. Zeker weten. Zeker weten. Er is nagesprongen. Dit is een opdracht gebeurd. Dit heeft een team gedaan van experts. Maar dit is ook op 11 september gebeurd. Dezelfde dag? Dezelfde dag. Dezelfde dag? Weet je dat zeker? Ja. Was het zeker weten de 11e? Totaal heel waar zijn. Zeven uur nadat de World Trade Center naar beneden viel. Ja? 
hebben ze hard gewerkt. All of a sudden, a loud, incredibly loud explosion, and it was just an incredibly frightening scene. The gas, the screams, people immediately turning and starting to run, and I turned in time to see uh, what looked like a, a skyscraper implosion. It looked like it had been done by a demolition crew. The whole thing just collapsing down on itself. You hear this clap sound like thunder. Uh, so you could see a shockwave go up, the windows blast out, came down floor by floor. The structure stayed intact until it all hit, hit the ground. A amazing, incredible picture word for the third time today. It's a surreal environment. It's, it's almost impossible to describe. Again, except to make a war correlation. Whoever said somebody declared war on us, it certainly looks like it, doesn't it? In all nature, life is fast and quickly lived. The conqueror feasts upon the conquered, and in death, the dead feed the living. When people say you can't abolish war, it's with us forever, I say, well, we haven't tried very hard yet. The abolishing of war is a long-term project, and it's compatible with sometimes having to have skirmishes, unfortunately, but there's more to it than that. War can be called not a highly evolved activity, perhaps, but a primitive system which is hosted by Homo sapiens and by various communities and nations in Homo sapiens. And if you've got the system in your community, then I will feel I need to host it too because yours threatens me. So it's a mutually reinforcing kind of tumor on uh, human society. Now, most species on the planet don't have anything to do with war, apart from 5,000 species of ants. Um, so Homo sapiens are rather unique in this way. Is that gloomy? Well, it is, but it's possible that we may be able to abolish this system. And I became very intrigued here by activists in the 19th century, especially in England and the United States. There's a big overlap between people who were disgusted with human slavery and people who were disgusted with war. They, they thought human slavery was a front to all that was moral and spiritually right. We want to abolish it, they said. And you know what? They did. But the same people wanted to abolish war. They considered it a custom like blood sacrifice, which is ancient and which is outmoded. And we are, we are better than this. We are better than this. We don't need it. We can abolish it. Now, a lot of people will say this is ridiculous, this is utopian, but of course, you don't get up one morning and say, today we abolish war. It's a gradual process, and you do it by delegitimizing war, by showing that it isn't brilliant, and it isn't moral, and it's a degraded system. We don't need it. And you do this slowly, and it may take a very long time, and you do it by replacing it with other systems which perform the valid functions that war sometimes provided. You show how it can be solved without war. Years ago, I had the opportunity to interview a woman. Uh, she was based in Geneva. And I asked her a number of questions uh, because this was, we were about to go off to Afghanistan. I said, now, could you describe your job to me? My job, she said, is to look out for the welfare of 12,000 children. I could barely absorb that. There was 12,000 refugee children that it was her job to look after. Now I thought that was a noble job, a job worth doing. And I asked her a question about war and she just went into a terrific uh, huff. She said, war, war. 
we could abolish war tomorrow if the Security Council wanted to. So the solution, it seems to me, is not to say the UN's no good, let's not fund it, you know, international law doesn't work. No, you try and make them work. The basic ideas are sound. And yes, they were manipulated by elites, and especially they are today. But these ideas had been pushed for for over a century by citizens who were trying to find a different way. These are substitutes for war. That's what they are. These are all things you do along the lengthy path to abolishing war. Nine Eleven was a tremendous war trigger. It led to destruction of whole nations. It led to a lot of deaths, refugees, and as the Buddhists would put it, grief, lamentation, and despair. We cannot accept it because it's a fraud. We have to study it, we have to expose it. When I realized I might not be around very long on this earth, I thought, well, let's try to complete this mission in a dignified way. Whether it's through research or doing this film or putting my articles together into a volume which is happening, we'll try and complete this mission. You do your best. I know it's trite, but there you have it. I've been an anti-war activist, and I have paid special attention in the last 17 years or so to 9-11, this fraudulent war trigger. And I've done my best, and I'm, I can go with a satisfied mind. Times of 